Tatlin Tut, welcome to the Creative Guy Podcast. It's good to have you here. Thanks for having me. So I've been following you for a little bit. Your work is uh, phenomenal. Every single piece that you put out is truly um, what I aspire to create. And um, I don't really know much about you or your background. Can you share a little bit about how you grew up, where you grew up, and kind of how you stumbled upon this uh, this creative endeavor of cinematography? Yeah, man. Um, I grew up in Burma. Yangon, which is where I was born and where I lived for 14 years. And then my dad was, uh, he won a DV lottery. I don't know, for people who doesn't know, it's a, a green card lottery. I uh, basically a permission to be here in US. Oh, this reflection is back again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I don't know how to get rid of it. It's like coming from the car. Just stay low. Oh, it's um, one of those reflections. Like you're on set, you're like, where is this coming from? But it's just like a random <laughs> car a mile down the road. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, no. So my dad won this DV lottery. And then all of a sudden we were like, okay, we're moving to America. And I was an oblivious child. You know, 14 back in Burma is kind of like still a complete child. Whereas in 14 in the mm -hmm. US is kind of like you're grown up and you know your way around and you're hanging out with your friends already. But um, but anyways, we moved here when I was 14, um, went to high school, then didn't really, you know, dealing with culture shock and learning English, but also um, just trying to fit into America. Um, I didn't even know what New York was. Like, that's how oblivious mm -hmm. I was. But um, anyway, so I kind of um, picked up a camera, I guess. This is like a typical story that everyone has. Mm. Um, picked up the Did you pick camera. it up when you were in America? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, my grandfather was a photographer for his own newspaper company. And That's cool. my dad was kind of just like a, you know, hobbyist photographer. But yeah, I did that when I was in, kind of, uh, in oops, sorry. That's okay. This was, a, this was an alarm for this. Um, Anyways, I did that as kind of like an outlet to kind of communicate, I guess, visually um, as a hobby again. But then in high school, I struggled so much with English, but also just trying to fit in, keep up with school work and all this stuff. So, um, And then when I went to college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Got a oh, big do you, fire do you truck wanna, coming in. Yeah, do you want to <laughs> wait for that? <laughs> a That's lot of distractions. Right. Yeah, 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 it's all right. I've, I've kind of like after a while, I've realized that distractions are just like it. They come and go. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what was I? Oh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in college, so I just randomly signed up for a film class and, mm -hmm. and film program. What college did you go to? Hunter College. It's in the city, um, fifty eighth and Lex. Um, okay, commuter cool. school, CUNY. Um, yeah. but um. Yeah, that's that's sort of how I started. I mean, there's a whole other side of the story where I started rollerblading, like aggressive inline. Um, and, you know, through that, I started filming rollerblading and uh, started editing and things like that. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe film could be an outlet for me and it could be an easy way out. Because I wasn't, I wasn't really like a... Um, it ended up being not easy way out. Obviously, we all know. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I was not like an academic person at all whatsoever. I wasn't mm. doing well in school, you know, because obviously it, the English part, but also um, just getting, fitting into the, the new scene, right? Um, all of that was kind of uh, getting in the way. But when I found film and rollerblading and things like that, I was just like, okay, this, this might be something that I could do. And here I am. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's, that's amazing. It's like, uh, it's like a lot of filmmakers or it's DPs particular. I know they start in like the skate scene, like skateboarding, but you started in like rollerblading. So it's similar, but different. That's when you started filmmaking there and then you went to college and you started to want to pursue this as like a career. How was the support of your family? Were they supportive of this like creative endeavor? Because it's not a typical safe path at all. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I left this part out. I mean, I secretly signed up for these classes. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> they didn't really know. I mean, they, you know, me being, you know, Asian background, they wanted me to be an engineer, actually. My dad was an engineer. I mean, he still is. And um, we actually, he wanted me to go to NYU for silver engineering. 
And I was like, I don't know how the hell I'm going to do that. You know, <laughs> I, I barely had enough grades, <laughs> uh, good enough grades in high school. Um, but I mean, I, I told, I was just like, you know, super honest with them. I was like, I don't think I can do this, but you know, if you want me to go, I can try. But, um, being immigrants too, like, you know, they wanted the most prestigious school. They wanted me to mm-hmm. go to the most prestigious school, but it ended, ended up not working out because they saw the prices and, you know, NYU was super yeah. expensive and, and I was like, okay, maybe we can go to a CUNY, you know, city school, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I did that without kind of telling them and, you know, sign up for film classes. It, it took, it took them a while to kind of, uh, accept that this is kind of like a, uh, feasible career. Um, mm-hmm. till this day, they're just like, okay, well, you know, freelance, I don't know, I don't really know about this. And when COVID happened, they're like, well, this is, here's my point, you know, you don't have any savings and things like that. And, but, um, yeah, it took them a while to kind of accept this, but, you know, I proved myself that this is a worthy career and I'm doing well at what I do. And yeah. I love that because I've had, a, I had a similar experience. I, I know a lot of people that I've talked to as well, where their parents initially aren't super supportive, but there is an element of you having to prove what you want to do as being viable. Like you mm-hmm. can't always just ex- assume that your parents are going to accept everything because in reality, they just want you to be happy, successful, and safe. And sometimes, you know, when you approach filmmaking to them, That is the opposite of all of those things. So I I think it's great that you also had to kind of prove yourself uh, to them because I I had to as well for my parents. Um, Yeah. So when you went, when you went to college uh, and you started filmmaking there, is that when you started to build like a community around filmmaking? Like when did you start building friends in this industry and starting to, uh, you know, have a circle of people within the filmmaking space? Yeah, that's, that's where I met everyone really. Um, all of my friends till like maybe I don't have a lot of friends from college anymore, but there's a couple of people that's from my class, from my school till this day, we're still friends and we actually work together in the film industry. But yes, that's where I built most of my community and um, people that I work with uh, back in school, you know, gaffers and directors mm-hmm. and things like that. And it's where I met everyone. And that's how I got into the industry. And that's how I got started in the industry. I mean, it's not NYU, it's not SVA, you know, it's not USC or whatever, but, or AFI, but it's still something I learned a lot, um, and made most of my dear friends from, from Hunter. Amazing. What did you, besides like your friends, did you learn anything of value, like technically or industry wise at film school, or was it mainly for the connections and friends? Um, I would say I learned a good amount, I would say like. It, let's say 70% of what I learned mm. back in school is what I know now. Obviously, most of the technical onset experience was from interning, from, you know, just knowing other school. But basically, I, I just hung out with a bunch of NYU kids <laughs> um, <laughs> and made made my way through their short films and things like that. But yeah, I mean, mm. I had a very good cinematography professor um, we learned a lot of theory, which at the time I didn't appreciate. Um, but you know, now I see the value of it. And, you know, back in the days it was just like all about technical stuff, like, okay, cameras, we just want to shoot, 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 shoot. But yeah, we learned a bit about producing as well. Um, I think it was a pretty well-rounded like film program. And we Mm -hmm. learned how to shoot on film and I didn't even know what film was back then. Right. (laughs) Um, We learned on 16. So yeah, it was, it was nice. That's awesome. Yeah. When you were, when you uh, came out of school and you know, you're starting to look for jobs, what was that process like for you? How did, did you start initially DPing or did you crew? Did you PA? What was like your step-by-step process kind of after you graduated? Yeah, I was very lucky. I mean, I was always kind of like an active person. Um, I knew that I needed to take initiatives, especially in college. Um, I interned at a equipment office. I interned at like film office. And through there, I met a couple of people that were very important to me in my life now. And, you know, I would never forget their names and, you know, uh, what they've done for me. Um, but that's, that's how I met uh, a couple of ACs that are working in the industry. 
And then from there, I would cut school. I would cut classes just to go camera intern on like commercial <laughs> shoots. <laughs> wow. um, and then from there, of course, like met a bunch of people and kind of spring rolled from there, you know. But mm. I mean, that's kind of like the fast way. And then right after college, I, from those connections that I made, I got an opportunity to first AC on a feature. It was like getting paid like oh, 100 wow. bucks. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, you know, first ACing, like I don't even know. <laughs> I really didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I did somewhat well, I guess, to keep growing, right? Yeah. But <laughs> you didn't uh, get fired. Well, no, I didn't get fired. I didn't get fired. It was a very low budget feature. It was like a 12 or 15 day um, shoot. Um, and then from there, I kind of went kind of, I first ate, see, I first ate seed when I graduated, like literally the day after. Well, and then I had to kind of step back down for like camera PA, DIT, mm. second AC loader, um, camera operator, and you know all of that. But I kind of went backwards. But I'm so glad that I had that experience because, um, in terms of camera stuff, I like to think that I know a lot in on that side, you know, and it helps me um, when I'm shooting. So yeah, right. Hmm. Do you, th do you also think there's an element of like when you, where you are now as a DP, I think, uh, in my experience, half of my job, half of the job of DP is honestly being a good leader and being really good at communicating what you want to your crew members. Do you think working in those positions kind of helped you get, gain a sense of like relatability to those people that you have on your team to be able to lead them and communicate with them effectively? Totally. Totally. I mean, I, I think being, have, having done those positions, having experienced what it's like, um, I definitely try to be always crew first as much as I can. And, uh, you know, there's all this politics about, you know, fighting for the rate that they need to get and um, mm -hmm. not going OT and not overworking them and things like that. For sure. I mean, leadership, being in a leadership position and having done those positions definitely helps and it helped me till this day. And I think it will help me throughout the rest of my career. Um, mm. yeah, yeah. I don't know if I answer when your you, question, but yeah, no, a hundred percent. Um, you, you know, you've done all of those crew positions you're at, you know, you're shooting at a pretty high level. Now, when you first started cinematography is what you're doing now, how, like how you anticipated your career turning out to be like, what's different about being a DP at the level you are now compared to, uh, when you first started? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I don't, I don't know if there's like one answer to answer that. Sure. You could answer but, all, you can have multiple <laughs> answers. <laughs> um, what is it? Di what, how is it different now? Right. Basically. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, I think I, I prep a lot more. I pay more mm -hmm. attention to, um, the creative, the script or where, whatever it is, you know, I'm doing commercials mainly, but for the jobs that I care about, I mean, I care about every single job that I do. Um, but for the ones that really, really matters, I think, how is it different now? I put in a lot more time and effort into prepping mm -hmm. and then also pushing directors to, um, take more risk, um, with the creative or um, try new things and things like that. Um, where do you, and then, if, if I could interrupt real quick, yeah, where yeah. did you get the confidence to kind of push directors? Cause I think I'm starting to get into that phase now of my career where I'm less, um, not, not, I wouldn't say a pushover where I get a creative and I just shoot the creative more so now where I'm like, okay, I get a creative. How can I elevate it to the point where I'm like pushing the director out of their comfort zone a little bit? How do you kind of balance that or how do you work in that, in that relationship? Yeah, just to backtrack a little bit, you said something about, you know, just getting the creative and doing the creative. That's how I used to be. That's probably mm -hmm. why it took me a while to kind of get to where I am. I mean, it was like five or six years of just grinding and grinding. And I was like, where, why am I not, you know, getting to the next level? Is it me? And then you realize maybe it is you, um, that you weren't, you know, pushing yourself enough or taking more risk and maybe not pushing the directors or pushing the producers to how you want to do things. I think that's the main thing, right? That's the question. That's the answer that I have. It's like really challenging yourself, um, just to the next level and elevate as much as you can, whatever you're doing. Um, what was the question that you had just said? 
Um, the one before this one? No, just just the one that uh, you just asked just uh, now. Just like uh, gaining the confidence to, like, oh, right. I guess, yeah, to trust your abilities and trust the ideas that you have to actually push that director. Because you could, you know, you could push the director, but if you don't trust your own ability or confidence, it's hard to back what you want to do. Yeah, totally. I think it kind of came naturally. And and because I started in fashion, um, I worked with a lot of photographers and things like that. And, you know, photographers don't really know too much about the filmmaking side of things. I mean, some people do, some people don't, and they lean on you. They trust you to push whatever that you want to do on the film side. So I started that way and, you know, started tasting the, the, um, your ideas being kind of, uh, come to life, I guess, through, through these photographer directors. And you're like, wait, okay, maybe I can inject more of this into my other work the real, like, you know, the other commercial work that you do. Um, and then there was one job that kind of changed a lot of things for me. Um, James Blake, it was for Spotify. Oh, amazing. And this director who also owned this production company, um, he was just like, hey, look, I'm, you know, pitching for this job. Do you want to just add any ideas to this treatment? And I was like, of course. And he was like, just go crazy just put in all the ideas that you've been dying to do, you've been wanting to shoot. And I just started that. And, you know, it turned out great because I was able to be me, myself, and and I did whatever I wanted to do. So that Amazing. was like a creative freedom taste that I got. And I was like, okay, well, how can I incorporate this on all the future jobs? And I started that way. And, and I think like directors are, the way that I see it is like, as DPs, you want your gaffer or key grip to like suggest things, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you might be so busy and so stressed that like, you don't really know how to light certain scenes, like in the moment, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and, and same thing, like I'm sure directors go through this, They're like, well, we don't really know how to approach this. Like we really lean on the DP that we brought on, um, to bring new ideas and they welcome all of that. So whenever they welcome it, I just push as much as I can. Um, mm -hmm. of course to a certain limit, but sure. whenever I can, I just, you know, have that conversation very, very, very early on, even before your book. Mm. Yeah. When you're starting to approach like new levels and you're starting to bring like new equipment, bigger equipment on like, I don't know, techno cranes, for example, like that's something I've never worked with yet. How do you, how do you feel confident in like pitching that idea? Like this is the right tool for this job when you've never done anything like that before. Yeah. I think being, having done assistant work helps because I've learned so mm -hmm. much from all these, you know, big shoots that I was on, whether I was a loader or second AC or whatever, I just was a sponge that was absorbing everything. Um, and having worked for like, good DPs when I was the first AC as well. All of that, all of those experience kind of helped, but also watching BTS, man, I don't know. <laughs> like I watch a lot of <laughs> BTS and knowing that like, and talking to your key grip, talking to your crew, um, mm -hmm. asking for advice from other people who have done it um, and not be afraid of asking for help, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a combination of all of that. And then just from your gut feeling, right? It's just right. more like, okay, I think this is, the way to do it. And maybe sometimes I have made a wrong decision. It wasn't the right tool for the job, but you learn from your experiences, or at least I did. And mm. then from there, you just feel more and more comfortable. You know, you pitch the producers like, okay, well, there's, if you don't have this, there's no way we can do this shot. There's another way, mm. but it will make, you know, take more time, blah, 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 blah things like that. Yeah. Mm. I wonder if you've had like a similar experience where in the beginning for me, I think my lack of confidence in myself resulted in me hiring gaffers and key grips that weren't necessarily like amazing. I think they were at like a similar level to me or a little below, but I slowly got to the place where my work wasn't progressing. And I realized that the people that I was surrounding myself with maybe weren't at a particular level. When did you feel at a certain point, maybe in the beginning, that you were afraid to hire amazing crew members because they they potentially didn't think that you were, you know, capable or you didn't think you were good enough? Like, I think I'm getting to the point now where I'm hiring amazing crew members because I know the benefit that they provide for me. 
Yes and no. I think, again, going back to the assistant background, I have worked with really good crew and learned from those crew. Um, I think, so. I don't know who said it, but some I, I heard this quote oh, so long ago, but hire the best and let them do mm-hmm. their job. Um, and I never forgot that. And, but th- there is to, there is a certain limit to that, right? You know, you don't want to go hire like Chris Nolan Scaffer or something and they may, <laughs> have, may not say yes or their first AC, whatever. Um, but I just, you know, I never forgot, forgot that quote. And I just see right out of when I started shooting, I just hired people that I was working with as a first AC and they were open mm-hmm. to it, but it, you have to be careful because uh, you want to hire them on the right job as well. Right? Like pay the right rates and things like that. But you don't want to meet them too early in your career. At least that's how, what I've experienced. And and for them not have your respect. Um, and mm-hmm. then you have, you know, things like that could happen. But I think if they are your friends and people that you work with, like especially for me, like these are people that I worked with as an assistant that I work with till this day. Um so they were supportive of, you know, when I was coming up and things like that. But yeah, totally. I mean, like there are so many people that I also worked with around, you know, not just in US, but um, in Europe or Asia or whatever. Sometimes the the top crew isn't always it either because mm. they have a certain way of doing things. And, you know, I feel like sometimes younger younger guys will work for you much harder because they're eager and I don't know. I, I think it depends really, you know, whoever is like, I, I need my gaffer to, 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 to think like a DP, <laughs> if mm-hmm. that makes sense. And if they're down yeah. to that and a great attitude, that's, that's all I care about. It's not really about like chasing, you know, who's the best, but, um, whoever is kind of meshes with you for the right job. Mm. I think that's a great point. Um, you know, you're starting to work with directors. How do you, how do you kind of cultivate relationships with directors or a lot of the ones that you work with now currently ones that you've built with over the past couple of years or a lot of them like newer relationships how, how have you built your relationships with directors yeah um i think for a long time i was working with a lot of new and newer directors new directors all the time like like i get repeating directors but like it's always new because also because i was new you know i've only been mm. professionally doing this for like five or six years now um wow. i didn't count the days you know the, the school days of course <laughs> <laughs> i i started counting when i got signed to an agency basically um mm-hmm. and during that time i was just getting new directors working with new directors all the time and i try to keep the relationship so that they come back to me or whatever but lately um it's been like four or five directors that I keep working with nonstop. Like, um, and I don't know why they keep calling me back. Maybe I can ask them, (laughs) but (laughs) you know, I, I like to think that we have this relationship where we both understand each other and, you know, you don't really need to talk about it. It's okay. Here's a new Mm -hmm. creative. I think we both understand each other as well. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, there are directors where I know that I really want to win them over. So again, going back to like prep work, like I will put in a mm. lot of effort in my time to prep as much as I can, um, put in, you know, inject ideas and things like that, bring new ideas to the table. Um, yeah, that's that's sort of how I've been doing it. And I hope it's the right way. <laughs> been working so far. So, yeah. Mm. That's awesome. How, like, what are, what are some challenges that you've, faced as you've grown to new like levels as a dp because i feel like every you know step that you take presents new challenges and new obstacles like at this current moment where you are what are some things that you're learning about yourself as a dp or even just a person in general yeah um man that's a very good question and it's going to take me a while to answer (laughs) that (laughs) what are the challenges that I'm learning or I'm facing as I kind of step up, right? Um, yeah. I don't know. I think, um, you know, the jobs gets bigger and bigger. They get more technical. So you have to be kind of well-rounded in terms of not just the Russian system, the creative um, stuff, but also knowing all the technical details, uh, talking, you know, learning how to talk to 
new crew, like for example, I just started doing like uh, car work and I just did my third car work. Um, so learning that system, knowing how to communicate with the crew, um, knowing when to say what and things like that. Um, that's from a technical standpoint. And then on the creative end, I guess, I don't know. I think I just have to watch more movies and, <laughs> and you know, mm. um, be in tune with what's going on with the trends and things like that. Um, and I don't know, sometimes the jobs get bigger, but then the, the budget don't always gets big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the expectations don't really kind of lower either. I mean, the directors and producers, client expectations are always here, right? So meeting those expectations while having this amount of budget. Um, so balancing that is, is always a, a battle. I don't know. I, mm. I, I hope that that's like kind of what you were aiming to, yeah. to get at, but maybe like, to yeah, let's, let's add something on top of that, I guess in the personal side, because something that I'm trying to navigate is like the life, the personal side of being a DP that, mm. uh, mm. Can, that people talk about as being a really difficult career to have like a, a personal life. And I know that uh, every time I see your story, you're somewhere else. Like you were in Milan <laughs> recently, or I believe, or something like you're all over. How does that yeah. affect your personal life? And how is that, how have you had to make the adjustment to your personal life to accommodate that type of work? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I saw that very, very early on and I heard about it very early on in my career. It's like, you know, it's hard to keep a family and, you know, uh, relationships and, um, and and even your your personal time, right? I mean, if I'm being honest, I don't have my personal time. I try my best, and I take whatever job I can get because I'm I, I like to think that I'm still building my career and I I have a long way to go. But it is a sacrifice that I come to kind of peace with. <laughs> um, mm. That that is that is what it takes. But not to say that you know you don't have to die all over this job, right? It's just a job. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man. I think, uh, I try to have time with my girlfriend, with my family mm -hmm. as much as I can. Um, with my friends, every time I'm not working, I'm either watching a movie or hanging out with my friends at a bar or something, you know, or going to a nice. museum or something like that. I try my best to balance social life and, uh, you know, personal social life, but also work life. But they all kind of mesh in mm. anyway, because all the right. friends that I have are all industry people. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't really have like a concrete answer to that because I'm still trying to figure out. It's something that is definitely in the back of my mind. Um, I know that I can't be doing this forever. And I'm hoping that at some point I get to a, uh, a level where I don't have to say yes to everything. And maybe I'm doing mm. features and that, you know, six months out of my life I work have a little bit of family time and friends time, social time. And then the other three months or whatever, you just live your life, you know? Right. And yeah. first, now you said you have a girlfriend. So that kind of like unlocked a question in my head because I have a, I'm engaged. I have a fiance. We're getting married oh, in two nice. months now. Um, oh, wow. And something that I've run across, it happens way more often than I want it to is we have like a date planned. We have something planned in the calendar. Like it's in there. I see it. And then I get an email of this commercial that day and I'm like, Oh no, what do I do? Nine times out of 10, I have to talk to her because I'm going to take this commercial. Is it like, how do you, ha have you had the similar experience with your girlfriend? Yeah. I mean, she is the best. I mean, she understands this job, what I do. And before, when we started, you know, when we first met, I had to preface this as, you know, like, look, mm. this is my life. This is my career. Um, not that you're not my first priority, but career also comes, you know, maybe second, right? Maybe she's first or career first. It kind of fluctuates. Um, I think so it does she too. I think that's yeah. Right. yeah. It depends, right? Like if it's like, kind of a money job or whatever, then you can say no and you can go on this trip that you guys planned or whatever. I think I try to prioritize vacations as much as I can. Like if it's a book thing, then I have to say no, you know, no matter how good the job is. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but then, but then like if I'm on a vacation and if I had to leave two days earlier, then she, she will completely understand, you know? Mm. And, and, and lately I've been kind of 
bringing them, bringing her along as much as I can to all my trips. Um, obviously, if it's like a director who's a friend of mine or whatever, if it's appropriate. But yeah, I think that's a, that's a definitely a tough uh, balance also. But you know, whenever I'm home, I try and spend time with her as much as I can. But even, but definitely before this, I was, and maybe this is too much information, but like I was single for five years <laughs> and just dating around, you know, nonstop. Mm. And, and at that time I was like chasing this DP career, you know, I was transitioning from first AC to DPing and it was definitely more important to be career first. Um, and mm. a lot of the women, like the girls that I've met didn't understand this industry at all, no matter what how much you explain it to them. Unless you are in the industry, you don't get it, right? So right. Um, I, I got to a certain point where I was like, I need to focus on my personal life. I need to get my life together. Um, and I did. I met this girl in Berlin and I moved to Berlin for three months and I made an effort to make sure that oh, wow. this was the relation. Yeah, <laughs> this was the relationship that I wanted and that I wanted to commit to. And so far, so good. She moved here. She's she's been here for a whole year now. So yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Ah, oh, that's yeah. I love that. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I find it to be. Uh, I, I feel very lucky because she. We've been together for ten years now. We met when we were fifteen. Uh, we're twenty five. Oh my so god. She's been. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like High a school rare. Sweethearts. High school sweethearts. That's right. Yeah. Um, she's been through every phase of my life. So she understands it better than I can even explain. Uh, I just feel very fortunate, but it's, I, I think your position is where a lot of people will be in that it's going to be hard to find somebody that really understands what you do and trying to find that balance takes time. Um, yes. You know, through, through your career, has there been moments where it's, it, it, it hasn't gone so well. Has there been moments where you've like decided like, I think it's, this isn't for me anymore. I, I, th I think I want to quit or have there been any negative moments in your career and how did you kind of push past those? I mean, so many times, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I still have it now, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you think like, you know, the job goes wrong or it didn't go as well as you planned it to be, or you imagined it to be. Um, you know, self-doubt all the time. Um, and I think like this never goes away for a lot of people. And I think if you don't have that, then you won't succeed or you won't push yourself forward. I think it's important, but it's also, it's toxic at the same time, right? Like you need that, mm. um, self-doubt and, and, and I, I don't know, um, lack of confidence, but <laughs> right. It's um, there's like also an element of being self-critical as well. Self-critical. Yeah. Yeah. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah. That's a better word. Um, I think we have to be critical. Um, but yeah, I don't, I can't really pinpoint any point where I was like, I want to quit. I, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I think I, I just always had the drive. And I also know that like, I don't really know any, how to do anything else. I don't know what career I would have if I didn't have this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that kind of came into my mind when COVID happened, right? Like when we weren't working for eight months straight or whatever, for however long people didn't work for um, I was like, I don't know what I would do, you know? So that, that fear kind of drove me to just keep going. Um, mm. and I know that I can't quit because mm. I don't know what I, what else I would do, you know? But there, right. there are so many times where I was like, I don't, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe like, I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm, you know, this industry is not a good fit for for who I am as a person. Like I have all of these all the time, but never mm. to a point where I was like, okay, I need to quit, you know? Right. Mm. Yeah. I guess like even more specifically, like what drives you to be successful in this industry? Like what, what drives you to be the most successful DP that you can be? I think, um, I, that's a very good question. I, and, and, and I don't know how to answer it. I, uh, what drives me? <laughs> I think there's a certain level Getting that deep. I want it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think there's a so, certain level that I want to get to. And even when I get mm -hmm. to that level, I don't know if it's going to be enough for me because there's always like, you know, um, there's always that next step that you could take. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think we might have to come back to that question because I don't yeah, know. I'll, I will come. I will definitely mark that and come back to that for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's let's change a little bit. I'm curious. When you said you started your career five years ago, is when you marked it when you got signed to an agency? Is that was that Gersh at the time, or was it a different no, agency? It was Pardos. Um, I haven't okay. noted here somewhere. <laughs> I have some notes here and there that I forget. Okay, so cool. I think, uh, yeah, I signed to Pardos when I was like, it was 2017. Um, so I was there mm. for two years. And then well, how did after- that come to be in terms of agency? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? And like, what point in a DP's career do you think is the right time to have an agent? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to answer that either because everybody's journey is different, right? So mm. I, when I was ACing, I knew that I wanted to be a DP and blah, blah, blah. And I quit for a year and I said, this is it. I need to quit because um, that's the only way that you can start selling yourself as a DP to other people. And when I first started doing that, I was like, I need to find an agency. I need to, that was my way of like legitimizing myself. Um, mm. telling people that I, I'm not an AC anymore. I am signed at a, a, you know, a DP agency. That's just what I do now. Um, but so you approached took, an agency. I didn't actually, it took me a while. Oh, it okay. was like two, mm. two or three years of just me kind of freelancing without an agency. Um, I got this opportunity to shoot this like, um, music documentary, a feature documentary. And, um, I guess the director who became my very good friend. Jason was looking for a DP and went to Pardos and they had offered a bunch of people and he ended up not liking any of them. And I think mm. he found me through somebody or whatever. And Pardos was like, Oh, who did you go with? And that's, this is a very common thing that most agencies do. Right. Um, and then they sent my name and then they, uh, Pardos reached out and say like, you know, we love your work. We've been watching your work for a while. And, and that's how I got signed first time. I, I didn't really know how to approach agencies. Like I didn't really talk to any of the DPs that I used to work for or anything like that. I mm-hmm. just kind of believed and hoped that when the time is right, it will come to me. And then that's, that's how it happened. Mm. And, and to answer your second question, when, mm-hmm. when it is the right time for a DP right. to sign, I think again, I think in my opinion, I think, when is the right time you will know and they would just, you know, it, mm-hmm. things will just automatically happen for you and somebody will reach out, you know, that's how I see it. And that's how it mm-hmm. happened to me. So, yeah. Right. How did you transition into Gersh? Cause it seems like Gersh is like the, the epitome of agencies. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> it seems like the best of the best. Um, yeah, man. Uh, how did I transition? Um, I wasn't, if I'm being honest, I wasn't really happy with how Pardos was operating at the time. Um, and they know this. I mean, they they don't exist anymore. Uh, they, they shut down. And I was very lucky because mm-hmm. three months, three or four months before they shut down, I was recommended to Gersh by a producer. And, you know, I had this oh, question wow. of like, hey, are you happy with Pardos, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but the thing is, Pardos is kind of rite of, pa- rite of passage at the time for a lot of the DPs, like all these DPs that are at like Iconic or CAA or all these different agencies started there, right? And so I was very honored to be there for sure. But at some mm-hmm. point I needed to grow more and I wasn't getting that Pardos. And but anyways, yeah, so the producer recommended me to Gersh and I spoke to Patty who found my agent for like four or five months and then I got signed after that but very lucky because Pardis was closing down three months before that and I knew that that was happening like out of nowhere it just came about and I was like okay I need to get signed somewhere like yeah. ASAP <laughs> <laughs> and when that happened everybody was just kind of all over the place but yeah mm. very very oh, grateful awesome. that yeah how do you utilize your agent? Like what type of benefits do you see from, uh, you said Patty, what does she provide for you as a, as an agent? Emotional support. <laughs> She's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I think that's the, the, you know, obviously all the logistical stuff, all the boring stuff, like, you know, negotiating and, and getting a higher rate or whatever and, and protecting you um, so that, you know, you don't get taken advantage of or whatever by, uh, productions or anything like that um and again just like 
just kind of like a pass through, you know, it just makes you, um, mm-hmm. what do you call it? Again, like the, having an agent just helps so much because, you know, when you're on two different jobs and somebody emails you and you can't reply fast enough and, you know, you can lose a job or whatever. Yeah. How do, it's not really utilization, really. It's just more of a collaboration between the mm. two people, right? Um, and I think like she she gets who I am, and she she knows what I want to be doing and where I want to go. Um, yeah, I, I, I a lot of people think that like going into an agency will get you jobs, which is kind of true and not true at the same time. It really depends on. In my opinion, like it really depends on who it is, how, where they are in the mm-hmm. career, um, how they communicate with directors, what their work is like, and blah blah blah, things like that. So it's, it's I think it's always different, and I think I was also naive enough when I was at Pardos, and like, oh, they're going to get me jobs and blah, blah, you know, things like that, and it wasn't true. I think they can pitch you as much as they want, but if you're not doing the work, then there's nothing you can do about it. If 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 the directors don't know you, if the producers don't know you, production company don't know you, then right, right. they could pitch you as much as they want, but there's there's not really nothing you could do about it, you know. Um, hmm. But yeah, man, I think I think mainly <laughs> emotional support and being there for me <laughs> if something goes wrong, and and of course, like I appreciate you know negotiation and juggling. I think the the, the other biggest thing that I'm remembering is picking jobs, like helping you pick jobs between Mm -hmm. like what to take. Um, what do you think about this? What do you think about this creative? A lot of the time it happens a lot and I always call her, you know? Mm. How often are you doing jobs that are equally like creative and you're passionate about it versus like bill paying jobs? Um, Has that changed throughout your, your career? Has those bill paying jobs just looked differently? Yeah, I think I think the creative jobs has been always there, even even when I was mm-hmm. starting out. I just didn't know how to navigate them. Um, I just didn't know, you know, like like you were saying, like we were just delivering what we were asked of, right? Right. So we're not really pushing boundaries. We're not really pushing like the director or producers to to do better to elevate this. Um, I would just worry about you know. How to DP, right? <laughs> How to be a DP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, navigating your crew and things like that. But um, I think it's it's rare. This is the well-known fact, right? Like everybody knows that creative jobs are really, really rare. But I always try and see every job as a creative job and not just a money job, hoping that we can turn it into something else better. Mm. If the creative was here, Let's bring it up to here as much as we can, even if it's not a hundred percent, it could be 80% so that we can all walk away with something happy. You know, all the money jobs I do are not really money jobs in my head. It's a learning experience, but also maybe you never know, maybe you could use this for something else, you know, you try right. your best to elevate it as much as you can. But yeah, it's at times though, when, when that doesn't happen, it's very frustrating because you put so much of yourself into a project and and it doesn't go well. But I think part of being a DP also is coming to terms with that, right? It's like not everything is going right. to go your way. Yeah. Are you the type of DP that is also kind of business oriented as well? Like I know a lot of DPs own a ton of gear and they're, you know, big rentals and that side of the, is like another side of the industry. Is that something that you have pursued throughout your career or do you just try to focus less on that and more on the uh, artistic creative side and less on the rental business side of things? Yeah. Um, business oriented. <laughs> I would say probably not because I always hated like owning gear because I didn't want to mm. lug around, uh, you know, a camera and things like that. And I, I don't like the negotiation of, I know you own a Sony Venice, um, and I mm. think it's very smart. Um, it's probably a smarter choice to make rather than not owning the gear. Cause you know, you could double your payment. Right. Um, right. but I think I'm just, yeah, like you said, I'm more of a creative focused person rather than, um, mm business focus obviously what we do is business right so you have to be somewhat business savvy but um yeah all i own is just a couple of comms monitors and uh nice 
in Santa Fe, which is, you know, um, it, what do you call it there? I'm forgetting what that is. Santa <laughs> Fe. Uh, Santa Fe. It. It's it? a uh, variable ND in a polarizer. Oh, okay. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Hmm. But small you things. Your but, own monitor or anything like that? Oh, I own I own like, my own monitor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like Do you bring it on every job? Yeah, I that so even bringing that it's like a is a little bit bigger than fifteen ten. Um, even bringing that is kind of a pain in the ass because I <laughs> wait. Sorry, oops. I don't know if I can. No, that's all right. You're good. You're good. It's all good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because you know you have to check it, and you know when you're traveling from city to city, it's always kind of um, some you know it's a, it's thing. a thing. Yeah. 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 But. I don't know. I try and get rental as much as I can. If it's the right job, I try and do it. If it's not, then I won't. But I really should get better about it because, you know, it's not free. So <laughs> right. I shouldn't be giving it away for mm. free, but yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that I need is a monitor because I was, I was on a commercial recently and I got like five monitors from a rental house and every single one of them looked different and it was just a nightmare. It's, oh, it's yeah, hard man. to... Yeah, because the client monitor is like way too dark and they're coming up to me like I can't even see. I'm like, well, it, it looks fine. Trust me, it does. But it's yeah, it's yeah. hard. It's difficult. I guess like that that sparked a question. How often are you communicating with the client or agency? And if they have notes on the cinematography, the way things look, how do you navigate those conversations? And do you go to the director first or do you are you direct to those people? Uh, I ne I try my best not to be direct to those people at all whatsoever because um, I don't mm -hmm. want to step over anybody's toes. You know, I I go straight to the director, and sometimes I am friends with agency, I'm friends with uh, agency producers or client. You know, um, they come directly to you, but I'm just like, okay, let me address this. I hear you. Let me talk to the director and see what they think. Mm -hmm. That's how I always have done it, and that's how I always will, unless something changed, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and, and, you know, the way that I see it too, it's like a lot of people dislike when they get those notes. And sometimes I respect those notes because from a brand perspective, from the agency perspective, those notes make sense, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, to a certain extent, right? Like I know the type of job that I'm on. Like if I'm on a beauty commercial, I'm not going to try and make it look like, a, you know, a, a dark <laughs> moody scene. Of course, right. and they, they want more light on the product. Of course, totally. That makes sense because from a client perspective, that's what they're thinking about, uh, how they mm -hmm. can sell this product. And for us, it's like, we're getting paid to do this. So, it's, you know, we have to be a little bit less selfish, but at the same time, you know, do what you need to do. So, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I welcome the notes as much as I can, but I always filter it through the director. Amazing. Um, I want to talk about one project in particular, the Starface mm. one that you shot. Oh, uh, yeah. When I first saw that, I, I feel like it had such a distinct look to it. And I, I remember reading a comment from someone. It's, it said something like, I've been trying to obtain this like silver look. And I think mm. that was like a, a pretty good representation of what it was. I guess for that project, how involved are you on the final look? And is that done through creating a lot before the shoot or is it working with the colorist after was that look in the creative like how does how do you manage that overall look of it yeah um i i'm still trying to get better about this because i um i used to not use luts at all whatsoever and i realized this is kind of like you're going back to your earlier question of like the challenges or how you, you learn to be different at this level or whatever um I used to not shoot with LUTs at all whatsoever. And my stuff ended up looking the same most of the time because you get mm. so used to, to like what 709 looks like and you, right. you're not really open to different looks later on in the color session. Um, so for this particular one, we knew that we needed to make it look like, you know, pay an hom homage to 90s and to the 90s era. Um, and, but I didn't really have any LUTs to work with. So I was just like, okay, let me just shoot it, figure it out. If I'm being honest, just let me just figure it out and post. And I had pitched this to the director where I was like, Hey, let's, we can't shoot on film, but let's print it to film. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I'm being completely honest, that look just came about, like it just kind of was discovered in the color session between the colors, mm -hmm. me and the director. 
um, it was kind of a surprise because we weren't really like, you know, very specific about, okay, we want this silver look. We want this to be like very nostalgic or anything. I mean, we wanted, we knew that we wanted to be nostalgic, but like not this particular way of looking, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of the answer. I mean, I, I don't really have like, um, specific references that I reference to, to get this mm -hmm. look. I, I just got very lucky, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that one's, it's when I first saw it, it was beautiful. I was like, this is way different than anything that I've seen recently. So I, it's, yeah. it, it's unbelievable yeah. looking. Um, and so pr I, I printing the, oh, sorry. Yeah. Can you explain that process a little bit? Like yeah. what, what that means a little bit more? Yeah. Printed new film is like always, you don't really know what you're going to get, to be honest. Like it's always different. Mm -hmm. Um, but I talked to a friend of mine who's, who's a director friend of mine who I worked with all the time when I started getting into this process and he like kind of done a lot of research about it and talked to the lab and things like that. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, as simple as, you know, having your edit color graded as, as close as how you want it to look at the end, then printing to whatever stock that you want to print to, mm. then regrading that because, you know, printing the film does certain things like bringing the saturation up or down or, or definitely more contrasty after you have printed. So you have to like fine tune it after, but that's, it's pretty simple um, and sort yeah. of cost effective way of, you know, having that look. Mm. I don't know if you have like any more find... specific questions. Yeah. Like the, I guess, what is the actual process of printing it to film? Like what are the how do you take it from, you know, DaVinci Resolve to, I guess, printing it to film back to DaVinci, for example? Like, what does that process look like? To be honest, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I just say, <laughs> you know, it's always been with post-production houses. So it's, right. they, they, they might have DaVinci, they might have uh, a different system. Yeah, some other. Uh, sure, base sure. light or whatever. Um, but it's, it's, it's not... It, it doesn't seem to be that complicated. You know, again, you mm -hmm. send it to the lab, they scan it, and then that gets sent back to the color house um, and they regrade it a little bit and then they ex export it. There's, it's not mm -hmm. like, it's not as complicated as like most people think it is. Sure. Yeah. Do you find that you have like a lot of creative control in post on a lot of the jobs that you have? Or do you feel that once you're offset, it's kind of like, I hope they do a good job? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think yes that's the battle no. we all kind of deal with a yeah. little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yes and no. I think, um, again, trying, you know, over the years of just having that bad experience, um, I tried to, nowadays, I try to have this conversation very, very earlier on, even before I'm booked. Like, let's talk about the colors that we want, you know, we want to mm. um, have on board uh, based on the creative, of course. Um, and what kind of look you want and you know we talk about who's right for the job and then bringing it up with the producer um then you know go through the whole process making sure mm. that that gets communicated throughout and remind them non-stop that that is who you want and that's how you want right. to do it. <laughs> but <laughs> i'm really like you know and, and i realized that like after after you finish a job usually you don't see the job for like two months or whatever right Right. But you have to like check in like, Hey, so two weeks after, how's it going? How's it going? <laughs> yeah. You know, because sometimes again, like they don't have a choice, even director for producers don't really have a choice because the client might be like, you know, I'm sure you've experienced it's like, Hey, we need to color mm -hmm. this like tomorrow. Can you make it work? Right. Or can you be there? Oh, you may not be able to be there. Then something goes wrong or it's not up to your liking, whatever. These kind of things happen all the time. And there's nothing, literally nothing you can do about it unless the director pushed for a DC. And mm. I live for DCs. I, it's, it's everything for us, in my opinion. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's something that I'm trying to figure out myself is how to get a little bit more involved in post and trying to bring colorists on that I want to, you know, beforehand. Because um, I've run into a few scenarios where, you know, I've been in conversations like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll keep you in the loop for color you know we have this email thread whatever and then like just nothing happens yeah I'm like oh all right well i guess i guess i gotta do a better job at that point um yeah that happens a lot to but, me too um and to a lot of people that i talk to you know but you yeah. really have to just get on get on top of them and just be like hey mm -hmm. what's up <laughs> right so 
you know, I said before we started that part of the reason I did this podcast is to be able to talk to people that are at like a higher level than me and be able to like, just ask them questions. Are there, how are you able to, you know, ask questions to people that maybe like, do you have people that you look up to that are kind of like mentor figures? And do you ask, like, who do you ask questions to if you ever have questions really? Like, how do you navigate the new uh, parts of being DPs or the new part of being a DP with people? Yeah, I asked all the DPs that I used to work for, um, mm. and they oh, become yeah. ASC and, you know, shooting features now and things like that. And then also your peers, really. Like, you know, I think it's important to be friends with other DPs and be homies, whatever, um, and my close friends as well. And and I sometimes lean to a community, like Cinematography Salon, or sometimes it's just mm -hmm. direct to uh, whoever does best, right? Like, so... For cars, like go to a certain person for like crane stuff, or maybe I might ask like other key grips. Um, I reach out to gaffers in LA and New York, you know, um, if I don't know how to do something or what is the most efficient way of doing it, I reach out to the people that I trust. So it's a, a various group of people, um, other DPs, even directors sometimes. Um, mm. you know, let's say I have a VFX shot that I don't understand and there's a VFX savvy director, then I will ask them that question. For example, the film out thing before I didn't get this process, I asked my friend and so, yeah, it's kind of the people around you and the community around you really. Yeah. Amazing. Mm. I want to, I want to, I'm curious about the ASC kind of thing that you were a part of in the magazine. How did that come to be? The what was the spotlight artist or rising artists? Yeah. Um, um, that's that's got to be an amazing, it's got to be an amazing feeling because yeah, uh, everyone no, wants totally. to be the AS. Everyone wants those three letters after their name. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So uh, a DP that I worked for, Todd Van Hazel, who's now ASC. Oh, um, dude, he shot uh, the what was the winning basketball time. Uh, winning time. Oh my gosh! Yes. Yeah, um, I did a couple of features with him. I mean, he's the best. I learned so much from him. Uh, there's another guy named Alexander Dynan who's shooting like all uh, Paul Schrader's movies nowadays. Um, I learned a lot from him in terms of fashion. But uh, how how did the how did the AFC thing happen? So Todd was asked to recommend a couple of people for the ASC uh, Rising Stars of 2023. And he told me that he recommended me, but it was a list of people that he had recommend and they had to pick from that. And, you know, I guess we were, all nine of us were picked, but that's so yeah, cool. that's, that's how it came about. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> um, I want to go back to that first, that, that question that I held before that you couldn't answer. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. hopefully you thought I'm about it. I'm thinking about it, about it in the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Let's bring that back. What kind of drives you to succeed in this industry and continue to do it at the level that you are and aspire to do? I think um, wanting to prove myself, I think, you know, and, and prove, prove myself to myself, uh, to my parents, and maybe to my peers and my friends. That's, that's mainly what it is, right? And also, of course, the love for the craft as well. Um, and the, 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 the drive to want to just keep elevating yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that answer that question, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I can think of right now. Awesome. <laughs> it yeah, may yeah. change, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, there you. we go. Um, yeah. I have one last question. It's my normal last question. Um, uh, well, let's start at film school, I guess. Like you, you, you know, you're, in America, you go to film school, the small little college, and you're starting to pursue cinematography. And that version of you is sitting at a table and across from that version of you is you now. What advice would you give that younger version of you as you're about to start your cinematography career and, you know, potentially oh, graduate college? <laughs> um... Wow. You don't have time to think about it... this one. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um... You could think oh, about man. this. It's usually, a, it's a tough one for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> what would I do differently? If I can provide like a little thing, a lot of, 
what people have said, and I find this to be a consistent answer, is that they wouldn't necessarily change anything because the struggles and the things that they've went through are kind of what make them who they are today. And I think a lot of people base their answer around that idea. It seems like a consistent theme. Yeah, yeah. No, that's what I wanted to say as well. And I wasn't sure if it was the right thing to say. But yeah, I wouldn't change a thing, to be honest. I, I feel like there was a reason why things happened the way they happened. And I learned from those experiences and it made me who I am. Mm. So, but I mean, there's not like one thing that could like change the career. You know, I'm very happy with how. Yeah, maybe not even like a change, just like also like a piece of advice as well from then, where you are now that could maybe yeah. be beneficial to that younger version. Right, 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 right. I would say do the work that you need to do and do the research. I think don't be mm. lazy and just put in the work. That's that's the, that's the most important thing. Put in the work that you need to to put in the work. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, dude. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be on here. I really appreciate it. This was a great conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, where can people find you, share your website, Instagram, whatever you feel comfortable Yeah, it's just my website, um, the H-T-A-T-L-I-N-H-T-U-T-Tatlin-Tweet.com. And then it's the same thing for my Instagram. Um, Instagram is probably best. That's where I'm most active. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you, dude. I will see you guys next time. Have a great day. Peace out. So thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Creative Gap Podcast. Hopefully you enjoyed today's episode. And if you did, there are a ton of other episodes for you to listen to as well. Check us out on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, whatever you, wherever you want to get your podcast, you can find it. Also, be sure to check us out on Instagram at Creative Gap for future updates, upcoming guests, and a lot of short clips. And for those of you who are new to the show, welcome. Hopefully you enjoy it. And for those of you who have been here for a long time, thank you. So that's all we got for you today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll see you next time. Peace out.